It's such a great pleasure to have Gerard and Christian here tonight in Novi Sad. Let's start with the re relevance of remembrance of the Holocaust now today, uh, 2022. Um, it is 80 years since the Novi Sad raid that we will commemorate tomorrow. Um, why is this relevant? Uh, to whom is this relevant? And would young people find this relevant? Or what should we do to uh, make it interesting for young people? Could we start with you, Gerard? Thank you, Mishko, for the invitation. Uh, I think it is a very interesting example because uh, actually nobody in Austria knows about this massacre, and that's a very typical thing. Uh, because nobody, especially not the younger generation, is aware that these things happened and that Austrians were actually among the major perpetrators. And this, of course, I mean, influenced the way that the inhabitants of large parts of Central and Eastern Europe later saw and viewed Austrian society up till now. Yeah? So, and it's only just started in the last, say, 15 years that people have become aware of this fantastically tragic role yeah? and, and murderous role that many Austrians actually played, especially here in the Balkans, and not just in the Second World War, but it started also in the First World War. So some of the people who were actually involved here in, in the massacre were already in the army in, in Serbia in a very bad role in the First World War. And this is a part of our history that we've sort of put to the side and I think this is an awareness which is now developing and uh, helping us to better understand also the whole relation of Serbians and the people living in the Balkans towards Austria. Yeah? And that, of course, nowadays when we have large, um, say, communities coming from Serbia, still living permanently in Austria, uh, that, uh, that is an understanding and a new kind of say, uh, perception of each other, yeah? that we have to come to terms with each other, that we share a tragic history. And this is developing now. Yeah? I think that not only that there is a great opportunity, but I think that we really have to explore this much more uh, to like, look at this history in, in a transnational way um, um, and also explore how it shaped our societies today um, and actually try to find better understanding towards each other. Now, uh, for instance, in Norway, the, the, the same uh, situation. Uh, Norway, as we spoke earlier today, uh, has one of these histories of the Second World War, which was violent and tragic in so many ways, and so many crimes were committed there. But I really doubt that many of the Europeans are aware of this history uh, kind of like far away north, because they know these general things uh, much more. Yeah, and I think then you are really pointing towards one of the really important reasons why we still need to learn about the Holocaust, because it's a story about our local societies, whether that local society is in Novi Sad, where, whether it is in Austria, or if it's in a remote part of Norway, like Falsta, where I'm working. But at the same time, these stories are local, but they are also jointly shaping a common European history, which is affecting Serbia today, Austria today, Norway today. So I think th this is, re in order to understand Europe, we also need to understand the Holocaust. We need to understand Second World War. Uh, and from a Norwegian perspective, I'm, I think I would like to say I'm extremely pleased with the development we have seen the recent years, uh, where we see how much weight is being put on Holocaust education uh, from the government when it comes to action plans, um, when it comes to regional governments allowing students to go to memorials. They are being paid, uh, teachers are being paid, buses are being paid for, for them to have the chance to go to Holocaust memorials. But most important really to see like the genuine interest with the students. 
we, we see 15 year olds coming to our institution who's really disappointed when their four hour visit is over because we have just really started. We want to learn more. And I think maybe one of the reasons they, they now are different than 10, 15 years ago is because their grandparents are no longer alive. They are not hearing the stories in their homes uh, and they need to seek other sources. And of course they can find things on the internet, but I'm really happy that they choose to come to memorials like ourselves and, and other memorials instead. Do you think that the a recent uh, tragic history of uh, the murders at Ute uh, um, contributed to the larger interest among young people? I think so. Uh, of course, we, we need to keep in mind that Norway has not only experienced Utøya, we have also had two other uh, terrorist attacks, uh, even though smaller in scale, still uh, extremely traumatic for a small society uh, within this 10-year period. And uh, this is shaping how people look at extremism. Uh, People want to learn about uh, what can happen when things really go wrong. Uh, whether this is shaping students' interest in the Holocaust, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure if, or how should I put this? I'm glad to see that the recent terror attacks has not taken focus away from Holocaust uh, education. Maybe it's more making people understand that it's good if we understand both. Uh, so students go to Utøya and then they go to uh, Holocaust memorials uh, in Norway. So it's actually contributed to making education about the Holocaust more relevant for the society today to young people. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think, think so. Yeah, I think also it is interesting uh, now, in this combination that is totally by accident, having Norwegian, Austrian and Serbian uh, history here disposed, uh, that uh, I feel that the history uh, of Second World War and the, uh, in particular the history of the Holocaust in Serbia as well as in Norway uh, is generally quite unknown in entire Europe, not only in Austria. Um, and that we really would need to develop more inclusive uh, memory culture uh, because I think that it is uh, um, crucial for people to get involved and to uh, um, do and work more on it to see that they are represented, that this is also about me. But also in the same time, I don't think that a lot of people in Europe are aware also of these other darker sides of our histories uh, uh, of collaboration that we have in our countries. Um, and uh, I think that this, that spot where uh, the choice is being made of collaborating uh, uh, in, in committing crimes is where the education and critical thinking among young people comes to life more, mostly. Uh, uh, um, and unfortunately, we are somehow uh, usually uh, trying to avoid uh, those spots in order to keep things more simple. Um, one of the examples of unknown uh, histories is the history of persecution of the Roma. Um, why is it still uh, so unknown and misunderstood? And uh, I mean, uh, I would think that most of the general public in Europe are still totally unaware of it. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I think the, the unknown history of the persecution of the Roma is a very good example, but it's certainly not the only example. Just on the, on the way here, we talked with Christian, and it's very interesting that if we look at this terrorist attack, yeah, I mean, what what is the ideology behind it? It's the gates of Vienna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the Turkish attack on Vienna in the 16th centuries. So, actually, we have to have this, as you said, this approach of a more general, comparative European approach, and then we have to break it down for the students 
into local history and see what happens on here, you know, in my community. Austria has been doing that for a long time and they've been doing it, as you said. Uh, for example, they were very active in promoting a new view of what happened because Austria had a comparatively big uh, Roma community and their faith was basically unknown. And this had to do with the fact that, first of all, they were not recognized as victims of racial persecution and of a genocide that took ages, actually. It was only in the 1980s that this sort of happened. And historians played a crucial role in this. First of all, in not seeing what had happened, and then in reversing, so to speak, the picture. Yeah? Um, first of all, they didn't see it because they couldn't see the victims in the uh, documents, in the files. And they were basically sort of uh, very narrow-minded. Yeah? They, they were looking at the persecution of the Jewish population, which was done by the Gestapo. And they were going through the papers and the documents, and the uh, Roma were, just went there. Yeah? And it took us ages to realize that ooh, ah, the persecution of the Roma was actually carried out by the criminal police. Yeah? And that's a completely different set of administration and uh, resource. I mean, the, the documents that we are looking for, they can't be here. But we finally found them once we knew where to look at. Yeah? And then, of course, the picture became a lot clearer. What is, I think, uh, very interesting to see is that in, in the moment when you get to see what was going on, yeah, uh, you start to find more and more and more interesting stories. And then, and then you see that this is not something about uh, history that happened to people that you don't know and has, have nothing to do with. Yeah? So I grew up in a generation, when I went to school, we learned about the Holocaust, and that was a horrible crime perpetrated somewhere where nobody had ever been, you know, you know, Belsets and Sobibor and God knows, by people nobody knew. Yeah? And nowadays, when we teach about the Holocaust, the kids can see that actually these places are not so far away, but the people who were the perpetrators, they actually, some of them lived two villages away. And the people who were the victims, actually, they also came from all around here. Yeah? And then you can really grab them. Yeah? And we, we see this, one of the problems that we've had, actually, in the last, say, 10, 15 years, is also we have big migrant communities yeah, in our societies. And usually their response is, but nothing to do with us you know I mean what you did you know the, all, all all these things that happened here the bad things that was you and your society we, we just come from somewhere else yeah but if we tie it together now as we are doing at the moment yeah, I said but listen you know what happened in your home country to your relatives in the areas where your families come from yeah? uh, that was our people yeah? so there is a common history that we have to talk about yeah? And also, what they don't know is that many, many people who were prisoners of war yeah, were in Austrian concentration camps. Yeah? And then once they realized this, the whole idea of why should we go to a commemoration of the liberation of Auschwitz or why should we go to a commemoration of Mauthausen, because it was full of Serbian prisoners. Yeah? And this works. All of a sudden, these things become interesting because you can relate to it, because it really has to do something with your own history and your under, own understanding. I think, of course, this is very important to identify yourself with the victims, but I don't think that we always and only need to identify on a national uh, basis, like, like in the example you just mentioned. I know, for instance, Norway is also a multicultural uh, uh, country uh, with uh, now a generation of students uh, coming from uh, countries far away, um, also with the uh, violent, even recent histories of violence, uh, bringing maybe their own trauma or, or trauma of their parents. Or, um, and also, it's a very challenging, I can imagine, to uh, try to bring them, to, to, to get them interested in a history of Europe where not even their grand grandparents were involved in anything. Uh, how do you go about that? And how are we, how can we create this actually a genuine feel of sharing the history and sharing the consequences 
on which we built the values that we try to build our, our society on today. I think that's a really interesting question and it, it sort of goes back to uh, the, the importance of understanding our common shared European history uh, and how that has really has shaped, it has shaped the building up of the institutions that we find in Europe today and it is shaping Euro uh, Europe also today. And then we have like in, in Oslo where one third of the young uh, generation uh, have an immigrant background uh, and <clears throat> they've definitely never had any grandparents who's told them over breakfast about the Second World War. Uh, and uh, for, I think it's crucial that they also have the uh, education on the Holocaust. Uh, but I think it's even more important that they bring their own uh, perspectives into these discussions. It's not us who's going to uh, give them a history lesson about the Holocaust. We need to have dialogue. We need to discuss with them, okay, so, so this was the Holocaust in Europe. This was Second World War in Europe. Do you have any recent experiences that you would like to share with us? And then suddenly we have these amazing discussions with these young, uh, young people. I think w one of the most eye-opening discuss uh, discussions I've ever had with a student was in the Falstaff Forest, which is the place of execution um, uh, uh, right next to, uh, to the prison camp where 230 people were executed uh, during uh, World War II. And in Norway, that is a high number of uh, prisoners executed. And we tell that story. And then one of our newcomers says, in one day? No, during the whole war. Okay, 200 people were killed in my village in one day five years ago. Okay that opens up a discussion. Mm -hmm. That really gives us op opportunities to, to talk. So I think this is not talking about the Holocaust in multicultural classrooms is, is a good thing. It's not, it's not difficult. It might be challenging, but it's really opening up opportunities. Yeah, and also now I, I just thought of that uh, student that um, made that comment well also then in my mind i thought yeah but these guys that were killed in the forest of falsta were brought from thousands and thousands of kilometers away from their village that was maybe uh, uh somewhere today in croatia or bosnia yeah. and they were uh, peasants serbs that ended up in 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 uh, such a such a remote place of of europe such as a Falstad forest. I think that it still connects us yeah, and absolutely. it still uh, uh, um, make this history when you when you point this out and, and uh, uh, built on it, as you said, the discussion on it, uh, more vivid but also more important. I think there is another point to this. It's not only the victims, it's also the perpetrators again. Exactly. So when we talk, yeah. I mean, many of the SS guards in Norway were actually from Austria and they were actually policemen. Because, I mean, one, one of the specialities of the Nazi regime was that they tried to integrate the police forces and the SS into one organization, which had the effect that many people who had been working as policemen were drafted into these uh, execution squads, which went all over Europe during the Nazi period, killed thousands of people. After the war, they came back. There was no written documentation. Yeah, maybe they had they were taken to court, but usually not, and they kept working on as policemen afterwards. Yeah, so this this is a story that, which is not really well documented. The the how to say the history of the Austrian police, for example, under Nazi rule, is still one of my pet projects that I would like to do. Uh, maybe I still can. Yeah, this is one thing. But I think what you said, I think we have to take it even a step further. We have to not only take it to a European level, we have to take it on a global level. Sure. There is, a, I just read a fantastic book by a, a actual Indian historian, Pankaj Mishra, who writes a fantastic book. And for me, it was an eye opener, you know, that you can see how the radical movements of today in Asia, 
that these are Islamists or, or the present day fascist government of India actually, yeah, under, under Modi, they were actually influenced by European thinkers of the 19th century. They have very little to do with traditional uh, Hinduism or traditional Islam, quite on the contrary. Yeah? So they, they are actually all uh, sort of uh, uh, pupils of the same radical European thinkers of the 19th century. And it's, no, it's not by chance that it is in India that Hitler's Mein Kampf is reprinted I think in at least 20, 30 editions, new editions every year. Yeah? So this is not a, a, a new radicalism that is coming out of a 3,000 year old tradition out of Asia, but it's basically the same uh, ideological uh, problems that we had 30 years ago, and they are playing now down in other parts of the world. And this is how we are related also in these migrant communities. Um, I have I have another question. Um, as, as I mentioned just b a couple of minutes before, um, the the focus on the um, problematic uh, uh, histories, more dark histories, problematic only in terms of that uh, decision makers are not happy to talk about them. Uh, in my mind, are um, very thought provoking. Uh, I think that uh, um, bringing the stories about the victims and personal stories about their lives are, of course, extremely important in order to understand what is lost. But what I'm trying to ask here is that one of the focuses of the education uh, about this topic is to try to understand the processes that led to the crime and also among the perpetrators, of course. So usually we speak about the ideologies, we speak about some motives that could be simple, such as robbery, you know, uh, but still there is this click in, in, uh, that, that happens at this certain point when you decide that somehow this is fine and that you will follow the, the stream or, or that you persuaded yourself that this is norm normality somehow. Uh, I think that it would be very interesting to develop further educational materials that would uh, um, bring these discussions, focus on, unfortunately, our own histories of perpetrators. Um, what do you think ab about it? Like, how could we cooperate better uh, and share it? Because I think sharing such stories would help because one would not feel too exposed that it is only about our bad guys, but like sharing it somewhere, some, in some way might, you know, ease up this burden. Uh, I think memorials really are key institutions in doing this work uh, because we, like the institution I run, we have about 75% of all students in the region visiting. Um, our memorial and whereas uh, the official Norway, uh, whereas the school system might find it difficult to jump into these controversial matters, still controversial 80 years after, I think we, we are in a good position to also include this uh, and the students will listen. We, uh, we just opened our exhibition in the commander's house. Um, uh, the commander's house at Falstad was built by prisoners in 1943 and was the house of the three last commanders at the camp still standing. Uh, we've spent 10 years refurbishing it and uh, opened up this exhibition Faces of Power, uh, which really looks at the perpetrator. And the feedback from the students is tremendous because this is a part of Second World War they haven't really heard about. And they are so interested in learning about who were the perpetrators, why did they make the choices they do. And I just have to share one experience. Um, uh, we also work with uh, some uh, people from the regional uh, area who went to Syria uh, to fight for the IS. Uh, and it's really, really special when you hear their stories. And then we look at the stories from 
some of the people who were in the collaborator camp after the war at Falstaff, uh, the Norwegians who were on the wrong side. And you listen to their stories and you see the same mechanisms. Why did you end up there? Whether you, whether you cooperated with the enemy or whether you made the radical decision of traveling to Syria. You, you sense the same reasons for the decisions. And I think that's really a good angle also to talk, talk to young students uh, using those kind of, of histories. I think there is an other angle there, which is about the discourse in the family. So if you have these families and the perpetrator families, there is a big problem. So I remember that since we learned nothing yeah, and our grandparents were not really prepared to talk about these times, you always suspect the worst. Yeah? The moment they say, oh, this, we, we, let's not talk about it, you say, oh God, what did they do? Yeah? Where were they involved? Yeah? And this is, this is, for me personally also, it was a very difficult uh, uh, decision. Yeah? And uh, I remember that this has a changed, uh, and uh, for for the next generation, yeah, it is a lot easier because we are one step removed. Yeah, uh, I remember that when my son was about, I think, fourteen or something like that. Yeah, he sort of all of a sudden realized from his grandmother that there were some Nazis in the family. He was completely shocked. He said, Do, did we really have Nazis in the family? Yeah, something like that. And they said, yes, and so. And there is a difference. So he could talk with me about this, which I could never do. Yeah? And, and uh, one of the most interesting projects I ever had was actually started off as a very stupid idea to talk with 12-year-olds yeah, about Holocaust. And they, these are, I mean, history teaching in Austria starts at the age of 12. So these were pupils who, they never had a history lesson in their lives. Yeah? And I don't know whose idea it was, but with, with the pedagogue, we had this idea, we said, we just do a mind mapping, you know, you just go through the class and see what is there as ideas. And it was the most fantastic lesson that we ever had, because there were so many ideas sort of, uh, in, in the air, yeah, and the people were full of things that they'd seen on television and heard at home, and you get all these discourses back at home. It was one of the, and, and it was very liberating for the children to see that it's not only them, and they are not special, and they don't have a problem nobody else has, but it is all over the place in the classroom, yeah? and uh, also it's in different areas of Europe, you know, because you had all of a sudden you had the civil war. In, in, in on the Balkans, for example, yeah? also that, yes, we, we have a similar story here and there, and that was very liberating for the people, and I think this is a, a fantastic approach when you can take it, yeah? and it also does not help you understand why the perpetrators did it, but it makes it a lot easier for the children to talk about these topics, yeah? And you get out of this trap situation where well, there is a, a German sociologist who wrote a very good book about, it's called Grandpa Was Not a Nazi, where families stay in this bubble of denial, you know, that nobody in our family can be a bad person. Yeah? And once you can burst this bubble, uh, it's quite liberating also for the people and for, for, for the pupils and for the general situation. A concluding question. Uh, how do you see the future of memory of the Holocaust? Is there a future for the memory of the Holocaust and education about it? Do we need to preserve it and work further with it? Absolutely. Uh, there is definitely a future and I think the future is quite promising. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see that uh, government supports to a higher degree than before, uh, institutions that work with uh, Holocaust education. Uh, that really shows that we do have the support from the highest level. Uh, but as I also mentioned earlier, uh, this genuine interest with the young people that we, we do want to learn about the Holocaust because it is important, that really gives me hope uh, for the future. Yes, I think there is, there is actually a, a very productive future for Holocaust education. Uh, I think the, the direction a lot of Holocaust teaching is taking yeah, uh, is very productive. For example, uh, the Memorial de la Shoah. 
Uh, last year had a, a fantastic exhibition, which I had never seen before, about the genocide of the German colonial administration in Africa. So the thing to show that although the Holocaust was a singular event, uh, it, it's not unprecedented before. So there were genocides before, and there will be genocides after. It has happened once, it can happen again. And I think this is a lesson that we have to take away from Holocaust education. Most of it will happen, hopefully, in centers like yours and ours, but a lot of it actually happens in media. Yeah? And I think this is where we have to be, get involved very actively in media production. Yeah? So that, that is the future. Everything will be decided there. Thank you so much for this talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.